today we're going to finish our discussion of the novel and then I will introduce the final exam. Next week's class will be in Chinese and we will read some British poetry from the First World War. Everything is on Moodle if you're interested. OK. One. What do you think Mrs Smith's key role in the Mr Elliot plot might say about the rigid class distinctions of that society? Two. Why do you think judging a person based on their private correspondence is a violation of the laws of honor? Three. Anne thinks of herself and Captain Wentworth that if there be constant attachment on each side, our hearts must understand each other ere long. We are not boy and girl to be captiously irritable, misled by every moment's inadvertence, and wantonly playing with our own happiness. Do you agree? Why, why not? Question four. In the end, Anne believes that she was right to refuse Captain Wentworth the first time. Do you agree? Why or why not? Five, do you think everyone gets their just desserts at the end? Why or why not? How would you describe the morality of the ending? OK, let's look at one. Mrs. Smith's role in the Mr. Elliot plot. What does it say about class distinctions? So we should look at what happens in that plot. How do Mrs. Smith and Mr. Elliot become connected. This is the entire uh, content of chapter 21. So we are going to look at some key points. Anne goes to visit Mrs. Smith again. And from the conversation, Anne suddenly realizes that Mrs. Smith she, uh, thinks that she will marry Mr. Elliot. And at one point, Mrs. Smith says, is Mr. Elliot aware of your acquaintance with me? Does he know that I am in Bath? This is a very strange question. Does he know I'm here? This means that Mr. Elliot knows who Mrs. Smith is. That they had met before. Hmm. How? Why? Well, soon and clears up the confusion and convinces Mrs. Smith that she actually does not want to marry Mr. Elliot. And when Mrs. Smith finally believes her, she finally tells Anne the truth about Mr. Elliot. Uh, let's see. Here he is. Hear the truth now while you are unprejudiced. Uh, page 132. Mr. Elliot is a man without heart or conscience. A designing, which means manipulative. Wary, which means careful. Cold-blooded being. Who thinks only of himself, who for his own interest or ease, would be guilty of any cruelty or any treachery, that could be perpetrated without risk of his general character. So any cruelty or treachery that he could do without risking his reputation. 
he will do. He has no feeling for others. Those who whom he has been the chief cause of leading into ruin, he can neglect and desert without the smallest compunction. Guilt. He is totally beyond the reach of any sentiment of justice or passion. Oh, he is black at heart, hollow and black. Wow. Wow. I don't think any of us were ready to hear this kind of evaluation of Mr. Elliot. We knew that he was hiding something. And Anne told us that he was too perfect. But maybe I'm sure I'm sure none of us guessed that it would be such a big, terrible secret. He doesn't give a fuck about anyone. Wow. Now, how do we know? Why should we trust Mrs. Smith? Um, later on, of course, Anne asks her. And. She explains. Uh, and the explanation is. That. Her former husband, Mr. Smith, who is now dead was once Mr. Elliot's friend. Let's see if I can find this. Um, here. This is on page 132, still 132. OK, sorry, it, it keeps going. He was the intimate friend of my dear husband who trusted and loved him and thought him as good as himself. The intimacy, the friendship had been formed before our marriage. At that time, Mr. Elliot was then the inferior in circumstances. He was then the poor one. So when he when the two men first met, Mr. Elliot was poor. And his goal in life at that moment. Was to marry someone rich. Here. Uh, this is the next page 133. Mr. Elliot at that period of his life had one object in view. Object means goal. To make his fortune and by a rather quicker process than the law. He was a lawyer. He wanted to get rich faster. He was determined to make it by marriage. So he marries a rich lady. And after that, he starts spending Lots of money in his life. And. He also got Mr. Smith to spend money with him. And because Mr. Elliot was so much richer than the Smiths. At that time this kind of lifestyle and behavior brought the Smiths to ruin. Now, in order to prove all that she is saying, Mrs. Smith brings out a letter that Mr. Elliot wrote to Mr. Smith 
proving that Mr. Elliot doesn't really care about becoming the next Sir Walter, or in his case, he would become Sir William. His name is William Elliot. He only cares about the money. But that will bring us into question two. For now, let's discuss Mr. Elliot. He was poor. He would do anything to become rich. He marries and becomes rich. Then his lifestyle leads his friend, Mr. Smith and Mrs. Smith to ruin. And after they are ruined, he abandons them. And Mrs. Smith has become a poor and disabled widow. Whereas before they were solidly middle class. So what could this tell us about the class distinctions of that society? What kind of comment or criticism could this be against class distinction? Well, remember last week we talked about Nurse Rook, common person, but because she takes care of so many people, she has the latest gossip. And in many ways, she knows more about human life than many educated and upper class people. So already the novel does not trust class distinction very much. And also remember that Anne doesn't really care about so-called important upper class people like Lady Dalrymple and Miss Carteret. Anne cares more about people who are intelligent, kind, and know how to have a good conversation. So again, class is not the most important thing for her. And because she is the protagonist of our novel, the novel also agrees with her. But what about this thing with Mrs. Smith? Because a poor man becomes rich, therefore a well, relatively well-off woman, Xiao Kang de Yiganyuan, becomes poor. And again, Mr. Elliot is upper class. He's from a noble family, whereas Mr. Smith is not. He is a common person with a little money. So it seems to be telling us that upper class people may not always be better people. On the other hand, this story doesn't really have any changes in class. It's changes in money. Mr. Elliot, higher class person, upper class person, wants money. And we know that in this society, money is seen as second best. The best is to be noble, upper class, and the second best is to have money. So Mr. Elliot's behavior it does not really fit with the upper class. He doesn't care about his noble name. He only wants money. So we could also say that the terrible things that happened to Mr. and Mrs. Smith could be because Mr. Elliot is not behaving according to his class. And so by ignoring class distinctions, marrying a common rich person, making friends with rich common people, Mr. Elliot creates disaster for the Smiths. So just like we talked about class a few weeks ago, on the one hand, it can be silly, right? Just because you're from an upper class doesn't mean you're a better person. On the other hand, in this novel, when people ignore their class and they cross class lines, bad things tend to happen. So I guess we could say that this is also similar to how Jane Austen thinks about class distinction. 
Jane Austen is from an upper class, so she knows that not every upper class person is a good person. But she's born in that society. She has learned the values of that society. So her instinct may be to think that when someone so openly and blatantly crosses class lines, it will create problems. The other main example is Mrs. Clay, right? the woman who is the friend of Elizabeth and that Anne is afraid will try to marry Sir Walter. Also lower class, very good at pleasing people. And it seems that by trying to enter the upper class, she is also causing problems. So it's a very rare thing, I think, for an author like Jane Austen to be able to criticize her own society, even as she still believes in the society's values. Do you have questions about one? OK, let's move on to two. So as I was saying, Mrs. Smith shows a letter from Mr. Elliot to Mr. Smith to prove that she's not lying. Right? Mr. Elliot is a terrible person. So let's look at this letter. Dear Smith, I have received yours, which means your letter. I have received your letter. Your kindness almost overpowers me. You're very kind. I wish nature had made such hearts as yours more common, but I have lived three and twenty years in the world and have seen none like it. Up to now, Mr. Elliot is being polite. Uh, apparently, Mr. Smith uh, maybe gave him some money or something. So here, Mr. Elliot is thanking him. Right? All of this is to say thank you. You're very kind. You're kinder than anyone I've ever met. At present, which means now, believe me, I have no need of your services being in cash again. So thank you for being willing to lend me money, but I currently don't need money. I once again have money. I guess this means that he just got married. Give me joy, which means uh, celebrate with me. I have got rid of Sir Walter and Miss. This refers to Miss Elliot, who is Elizabeth. They are gone back to Kellynch and almost made me swear to visit them this summer, but my first visit to Kellynch will be with a surveyor, Zhang Liang Shi, to tell me how to bring it with best advantage to the hammer. And the footnote says that this means he wants to sell Kellynch. The hammer is the auctioneer's hammer. Pai mai si de nega xiao tui So he doesn't care about the land or the title. He just wants the money. Uh, let's skip to the bottom of his letter. I wish I had any name but Elliot. I am sick of it. The name of Walter I can drop, thank God. So I think his original name was like Walter William Elliot or something, and he goes by the name of William. So you can see his attitude. He doesn't care about the family. He just wants the money. But Anne, after getting over the shock of this information, remembered or remembers that her seeing the letter was a violation of the laws of honor. She had broken some kind of moral rule or ro uh, moral code. That no one ought to be judged or to be known by such testimonies. 
testimony here means proof. So you should not judge someone based on this kind of proof. That no private correspondence, correspondence means letters, no private letters could bear the eye of others. So, which means that anybody, if you read their private letters, will make them look bad. They cannot bear the eye of others. So the question is why? Why should you not judge someone by their private letters? Well, the first part is easy to understand. Her seeing the letter was a violation of the laws of honor. That's straightforward, right? You should not read other people's letters. But then why, if you happen to see a, someone else's letter, why should you not judge them if it contains something terrible, such as Mr. Elliot's letter? Why can't private letters bear the eye of others? Well, think about this. When you write a letter, or you write an email, or you send a line message, you're only thinking about the person that you're talking to. And maybe it's not your first letter or first message. Maybe you have been talking with this person for a while. You have started a conversation. And so whatever you write, in order to truly be understood, has to be considered in context. But when you take someone's private letter, a single letter, and you read it, you don't have that context. You don't know what these people were talking about. Something that could be a joke, might look serious, something that might seem insulting, could just be chatting. It's very easy to misinterpret and misconstrue Trujie, someone's private letter without context. And also in that society, Manners were everything, right? We talked about this. It is incredibly important to behave in the proper way. But when you're writing a letter, it's like you and the other person are sitting in your bedroom talking about something that's only related to you two. This is not in public. And when you're in private, you don't need to follow all of the manners. You only have to follow the manners that apply to you and the other person. So of course, when you look at a letter and you see someone talking in a very impolite way, it will make them look bad. And so no private correspondence could bear the eye of others because it is private not public. People behave differently in private and in public. And the third reason is, of course, you're not supposed to see the letter. So if the means is wrong, the end cannot be right, according to this logic. This is very important even today, the right to privacy. Uh, today, when governments can intercept your electronic messages online, and when the police make a judgment about who is guilty, and then they build a case to prove that this person is guilty. Privacy 
is very important. The idea that the government or anyone else should not be able to see what you say in private is incredibly important. In fact, uh, recently you may have seen the news about abortion rights in the US. There is a Supreme Court case called Roe v. Wade. The what you may not know is that in that court case, the right to an abortion was protected as a kind of privacy. It's a private decision by a woman and uh, herself only, her own body and herself. It's a private decision. Therefore, the government should not intervene. 整个案件的逻辑就是说，堕胎是一个个人私密的行为，与任何他人无关，所以政府无权干涉。So you can see how important the right of privacy is. Uh, by the way, in Taiwan, the right to abortion is different, right? Uh, in Taiwan, abortions are illegal, except for cases of rape incest, health of the mother, and economic difficulty, Jingji Kunan. You have to have a reason to get an abortion in Taiwan. In the US, you don't have to have a reason. Okay, do you have questions about two? OK, three. We're going to see this quote in the text. I will explain the quote later. So at this moment, Anne had just come back from Mrs. Smith's. She wanted to tell Lady Russell uh, the truth about Mr. Elliot. But because of different coincidences and circumstances, she can't leave the house. And then the Musgroves appear and the whole thing turns into a party. And al along with the Musgroves, Captain Wentworth also appears. So now that she's in the same room as Captain Wentworth, she was hoping maybe they could talk, but he did not seem to want to be near enough for conversation. Remember, at this point, Wentworth still thinks that Anne loves Mr. Elliot. So the man that she loves is in the room, but is ignoring her. So she tried to be calm and leave things to take their course. Course here means a path. So to let things follow their own path. And she tries to talk to herself. Surely, surely means eating the ba. It's not something that's sure. It, it's a supposition. That's a tweeting you If there be constant attachment on each side, so for two people, if both people still are attracted to the other person, right? Remember, attachment means love and, and attraction. Constant means it's still there. So if two people still love each other, our hearts must understand each other ear long. Ear means before. So before long, we must understand each other's hearts and feelings. It must happen. It should happen. We are not boy and girl. 
to be captiously irritable. Captious means uh, easy to change. Irritable means uh, like negative feeling, annoyed, frustrated. Misled by every moment's inadvertence. Inadvertence means change or obstacle. So every time there is an obstacle, every time there's a change, we are once again led away from each other's hearts. And wantonly playing with our own happiness. Wantonly means uh, uh, willfully is the English word. Playing with our own happiness. So this quote means it, she's trying to comfort herself. She's trying to shore herself up. And she tells herself. If we each still love each other, we must understand each other soon. It will happen soon. We're no longer young kids, easy to feel annoyed easy to be led away from each other by coincidence or we uh, we are no longer kids who would follow uh, any kind of idea and play with our own happiness irritated, annoyed. Annoyed the Zhongwen is something. So this is what she's telling herself. And yet, Joseph a few minutes afterwards, she felt as if their being in company with each other under their present circumstances could only be exposing them to inadvertencies and misconstructions of the most mischievous kind. 但过几分钟他又觉得两个人这样子相处的状态, 只能是啊，对，恼人的，没错，呃，irritable，很恼人，很烦人的。他们这种状态只会让他们有更多的呃，就是负面的因人际会，穿凿附会。因这是因人际会，misconstruction是穿凿附会。Of the most mischievous kind, mischievous是捣蛋调皮的。那这边的意思就是会让情况变得更糟、更棘手的状态。So she tries to comfort herself, but when she really pays attention to the situation, she thinks that uh, this situation is exactly the kind of situation that would create more trouble between her and Captain Wentworth. They're together in a room, but they can't talk privately, and Wentworth doesn't even want to talk to her. Yeah. So the question, do you agree with what Anne says to comfort herself? Anne doesn't agree, but do you think it makes sense? If two people love each other, they must understand one day. And that the older you grow, the more steady you are 
in dealing with your emotions for another person. You know, 人越越长大，就是越能够好好的去处理对他人的爱恋情感。Do you think that makes sense? We can uh, look at uh, the first half and the second half. The first half is if two people love each other, they will uh, find out soon. Obviously not. Otherwise, how would we have crushes? Dan Lin. Right. The second half, the older you grow, the better you are able to deal with your emotions for another person. I think it depends on what you mean by older. If it just means how many years old you are, how old you are. Mathematically. Then no, maybe, maybe not. I don't think it's a sure thing. But if by older you mean like how Anne is older in feeling than Captain Benwick. Remember that? She said uh, Benwick's fiance had died, but that Anne herself had more experience because Wentworth had died and then come back into her life. And so even though Benwick was older than Anne, Anne feels older in feeling than Benwick. I think if you mean older in that sense, then yes, it could be true. The more experience you have with dealing with human emotions, the better you are able to actually handle those emotions, hopefully. But in this case, even though Anne considers herself to be the oldest in feeling, and uh, in discussing that question, we already talked about uh, how Anne and Wentworth are probably the most experienced in feeling in the whole book. Here she still loses her head. So this tells us, yes, maybe you get better at dealing with human emotion, but it's always possible that emotion will overwhelm you or overcome you. 呃，超出你的控制能力。No matter how experienced you are, and I think that's a good thing, right? If if it's possible for you to become so experienced that nothing creates such a strong emotion, you can always control that emotion. God, that must be a very boring life. No surprises left. You've already learned everything. So like in daily life, you might hear somebody say things like you have to control yourself. You have to act rationally and reasonably. You have to live um, according to reason. It's true, but it should not only be reason. These surprises of emotion, uncontrollable emotions, are also part of the human experience. Good emotions, but also bad emotions. If you lose someone that you love very much, and you don't feel sad, or you feel sad, but you can control it, how human are you really? Death or loss is one of the worst things that can happen in life. Why do we call uh, trauma that word trauma? What does trauma mean? Chuang sang, right? Xing li chuang sang. It's a wound. It's a hole in your mind, in your soul. When someone you love dies or is lost, there's a hole in your soul and in your mind, and nothing can repair that hole completely. Uh, something that you may not have heard is when someone you love very much dies, 
like if your parents die. Uh, and at first it's incredibly sad and painful, but people say that time heals all wounds. It's not true. Time cannot heal everything. It can help you accept and get used to life without that person. But for the rest of your life, you will always feel sad about it. You will never be able to go back to life before you lost that person. It will always feel different. Even for people who have lost their loved one for 10, 15, 20 years, and for most of their daily life, things are fine. Once in a while, they will remember that person. They will remember some detail, like some image or some smell or some feeling, and all of that pain will appear again. It doesn't end. Time can help to heal all wounds, but it cannot completely heal everything. Why are we talking about this? Oh yes, right. So even though Anne and Wentworth are the most experienced in dealing with human emotions out of all the people in this novel, even they are overwhelmed by that this current situation, and that is a natural part of human life. Questions about three? Okay, let's look at four. So at this moment, Anne and went, uh, if you remember from the movie or from having read this part, um, during that uh, gathering, Anne is talking with Harville about Benwick and about how Benwick seems to have forgotten his fiance. And Anne says something about how uh, people who, women who truly love a man, never forget and never stop loving that man. And Wentworth overhears her. And so he realizes that Anne still loves him. So he writes a secret letter for Anne saying, I heard what you said. I also still love you. Please meet me outside so we can talk about this. So she goes outside. They're on the street and they talk about everything. It's a lover's discourse. Now that they know that they had misunderstood each other, right? she thought he no longer loved her, he thought she no longer loved him, but now they know the truth. And so what they talk about is everything. From the moment that Anne rejected him, they talk about their lives all the way to the present moment. And they focus on how at each moment, how they felt about the other person. And they realize that all of their behavior throughout this entire novel has been based on a misunderstanding. And so now they clarify everything. Finally, they reach the most important idea. When Anne decided to break the engagement, did she do the right thing? And this is what Anne says. I have been thinking over the past and trying impartially which means objectively, to judge of the right and wrong. I mean, with regard to myself. And I must believe that I was right, much as I suffered from it, 
much as here means even though. Even though I suffered, I still think I was right. I was perfectly right in being guided by the friend whom you will love better than you do now. This is Lady Russell. So Anne still thinks she was right to follow Lady Russell's advice and to break off the engagement with Wentworth. She calls Lady Russell the friend whom you will love better than you do now. Wentworth currently does not like Lady Russell precisely because Lady Russell persuaded Anne not to marry Wentworth. But Anne is saying you will love her better in the future. You know, now that they are going to get married. So why does Anne think this? Why does she think it was right to listen to Lady Russell, even though it caused her suffering? To me, she was in the place of a parent. She was like my parent. Do not mistake me, however. I am not saying that she did not err in her advice. Err means to make a mistake. So Anne admits that Lady Russell's advice was bad advice. Uh, and she explains why. I'll come back to that part. But I mean that I was right in submitting to her. So even though it was bad advice, it was still a good choice to follow that advice. Because Lady Russell is like her parent. And she says, if I had done otherwise, if I had not followed her advice, if I had married you at the beginning, I would have suffered more in continuing the engagement than I did even in giving it up. So if I had married you, I would be e even more in suffering because I would have suffered in my conscience. She feels that it is the right thing to do to listen to your parents. Lady Russell is basically her parent. So even if she had married the man that she loves, if she had done so by disobeying Lady Russell, she would have suffered in her conscience. Liangzi. I have now, as far as such a sentiment is allowable in human nature, nothing to reproach myself with. So because I listened to her originally, now I have nothing to blame myself for. Reproach means to blame. And she adds this to be humble. Of course, if you're a Christian, everybody is guilty because of original sin. So she says, as far as such a sentiment is allowable in human nature. Now, so this means that she's ignoring original sin, that kind of thing. And if I mistake not, so if I'm not wrong, a strong sense of duty, sir and gun, is no bad part of a woman's portion. So it's also a sign of a good woman to do what she should do. And one of the things that uh, anyone should do is to follow your parents. So because of this reason, she thinks it was still the good choice to follow Lady Russell's bad advice. Now, why is her advice bad? It was perhaps one of those cases in which advice is good or bad only as the event decides. 用中文讲就是给的建议到底好还是不好,要以结果论. And so in this case, uh, remember at the time Lady Russell said that Wentworth is poor, not a noble, uh, doesn't have a good future. Wentworth said that he would soon join the war and make money but nobody knew whether it would actually happen. That is, as the event decides. 
um, and I'll explain more after we take a 10 minute break. Um, here's one. So whether Lady Russell's advice is good or bad depends on what will happen in the future. If Wentworth truly does not succeed in war and he does not make money, then the advice is good and should not marry him. But if Wentworth does go to war and make money, then the advice is bad and Anne should have married him. Turns out Wentworth does grow rich, so Lady Russell's advice is bad, right? I'm not saying that she did not err in her advice. Her advice was bad. But when Lady Russell gave that advice, she could not see the future. And so Anne says, I certainly never would in any circumstance of tolerable similarity give such advice. So in any situation that is roughly the same, I would not give advice. Because you don't know. Who knows? You don't know what the future will bring. But because Lady Russell did give her advice, Anne had to follow basically her parent. So in the end, Anne thinks that she did the right thing. And if she had ignored Lady Russell, she may have married the man that she loves, but she would suffer because she did not follow Lady Russell's advice. So later on today, we're going to look at the final exam. One of the questions is about the act of persuasion, of persuading someone. This would be a key part of that thinking. So if you choose to answer that question, this would be a good place to talk about persuasion. And this is on page 164. OK. So the question is, do you agree with Anne? I think Actually, no. Hang on. No, I think yes, yes. So uh, we can we can actually calculate this. Right, so we have four situations. Either Wentworth becomes rich or no. Or Anne follows Lady Russell's advice or no. So there are four possibilities. If Anne follows. If Anne does not follow the advice and Wentworth does not become rich, then it's the worst of both parts, right? Anne is now married to a poor man and her family does not love her as much. If Anne does not, uh, does follow Lady Russell's advice and Wentworth does not become rich, then that's a, the best possible ending because she followed Lady Russell's advice, so she doesn't suffer her conscience and Wentworth is poor, so he's not worth marrying anyway. He's worth loving, but he's not worth marrying. But if Anne does not, uh, if Anne does follow the, hang on, if Anne does not follow the advice and Wentworth grows rich, I, Anne says that she would suffer in her conscience. 
and I'm sure she would. But at least it would be better than if she had disobeyed Lady Russell and Wentworth was still poor, right? That would be the worst one. But today what happened is Anne followed Lady Russell's advice and Wentworth got rich. So now he's a very good husband material, right? He's a good catch for a husband. But Anne has not married him. So actually we can organize this uh, into we can we can uh, write down the order of preference. So like the best one is obey and Wentworth is poor. The next or I guess yes, the next best one is uh, I think it's obey and Wentworth is rich, which is the current situation. The third best one is uh, disobey and Wentworth is rich because Anne will have a good husband, but she will suffer in her conscience. And the worst one is disobey and Wentworth is poor. So the question here is, should Anne had followed Lady Russell's advice? And if we look at these four, the two best options are following advice. So yes, I would agree with Anne. She, I think she did do the right thing. Hmm. Obey and rich or disobey and rich. Which one is better? I think this is also a question of the event. In the novel, the ending is Anne finally marries a rich Wentworth. So of course that's a very good ending. But without that ending, Wentworth would be happy and Anne would also be happy, but it's like which which one would make Anne happier? Yeah, I agree. Money is a terrible evil, a necessary evil. Um, but the question is, which one would make Anne happier? To obey her parent or to marry the man that she wants? If she could only choose one, which one would make her happier? And I think that for Anne, she would be happier if she followed Lady Russell and the man that she loves had a good life with someone else, because at least then she would know that she did nothing wrong. Her conscience would be clear. But if she had disobeyed Wentworth, uh, Lady Russell and married the man of her dreams, she would still feel guilty about the way that she married him. So especially for a woman like Anne, who cares so much about doing the right thing. I think she made the right choice. I agree with her analysis. Uh, in these four situations, according to Anne's personality, I think she would be happier if she followed Lady Russell's advice, which is exactly what she did. OK, questions about number three, four, number four. OK, number five, just desserts. 
适得其所，就是。Uh, it means the good guys have a good ending, bad guys have a bad ending. Everyone's ending fits what they deserve. Dessert, in this sense, is the noun of deserve, right? 应得的名词 dessert. It's spelled the same way as desert, 沙漠 but the emphasis is is different. 那个重音不同就变不同的单词了 So the ending of the novel. Let's take a look. Chapter 24, what happens at the end? Um, well, we know that Wentworth and Anne get married. Uh, what about the other people? Lady Russell. Um, Anne knew, this is on page 165, Anne knew that Lady Russell must be suffering some pain in understanding and relinquishing, 是放放走 Mr. Elliot, finally knowing what kind of person he is, and she must be making some struggles to become truly acquainted with, and do justice to, Captain Wentworth. So she will be forced to readjust her evaluation of Mr. Elliot and Wentworth. And this process must cause her some pain. This, however, was what Lady Russell had now to do. This was what she had to do. No choice. She must learn to feel that she had been mistaken with regard to both. That she had been unfairly influenced by appearances in each. Yes, that is her mistake. Mr. Elliot looked perfect, so she thought he was perfect. Wentworth looked poor, so she thought he was worthless. And now she had to learn about her mistake. I think that's very fitting, right? Who else do we have? Mary, remember her? Uh, also very prideful, just like Sir Walter. Never happy when someone else is doing better than her. Um, so on the one hand, it's good news to have a sister married. And Mary herself can tell herself she might flatter herself so she can tell herself that she was greatly instrumental to the connection. Mary herself was very important for this marriage by keeping Anne with her in the autumn. Remember, if because Anne stayed at Upper Cross, so she had more opportunities to run into Wentworth. And so Mary could tell herself that this was her doing. This is how to go now. Uh, and as her own sister must be better than her husband's sisters. It was very agreeable that Captain Wentworth should be a richer man than either Benwick or Charles Hayter. So uh, Mary's idea is people from the Elliot family are better than other people. So the men who marry Elliot women should be better than the men who marry other women. Uh, Henrietta marries Charles Hayter. Louisa marries Captain Benwick. So as long as Captain Wentworth is better than those two men, Mary is also happy. Another thing makes Mary happy. Anne had no upper cross hall before her, no landed estate, no headship of a family. Anne marries a sailor. So she has no title, no land, no house. So as long as they could keep Wentworth from being made a baronet, Mary would still be in a better position. So that also seems to be an ending that fits very well with the kind of person that Mary is. 
maybe we feel like uh, she's not really a good person, so she doesn't suffer as as much as we want her to maybe. But the ending fits the kind of person that she is. Um, she's mostly happy, but there's one thing that makes her slightly unhappy in that Anne is restored to the rights of seniority. Uh, now that Anne is the woman of her own household, she is no longer treated as a worthless sister. And so now that Anne is elevated, Mary is in comparison lowered. You know, Mary is very Anne So that's the one thing that makes Mary unhappy. But everything else she thinks is a good match between Anne and Wentworth. Who else do we have? Uh, ah. Elizabeth, the eldest sister. Remember, she's still single. She had soon the mortification, which means embarrassment and suffering, of seeing Mr. Elliot withdraw. Remember, Mr. Elliot, before he met Anne, his purpose was to try to marry Elizabeth. Uh, but now that he has been revealed as a terrible person, he withdraws. And no one of proper condition has since presented himself to raise even the unfounded hopes which sunk with him. So after Mr. Elliot withdraws, nobody else wants to marry Elizabeth. That seems like a fitting ending for Elizabeth. Terrible person. But the only man who tries to marry her is also a terrible person. And now there's nobody. Good ending. I like that. What happened to Mr. Elliot? The news of his cousin Anne's engagement burst on Mr. Elliot most unexpectedly. So he was not expecting this news. Remember, up to that moment, Mr. Elliot still thought that Anne loved him. It, this news deranged his best plan of domestic happiness. Derange here means to derail. Uh, the word derail means to push a train off the railroad. He, and what was his plan? To keep Mr. Walter single by the watchfulness which a son-in-law's rights would have given. So his plan was to marry Elizabeth, and as a son-in-law, he would be always near Sir Walter, and so he could keep watch over Sir Walter, and prevent Sir Walter from marrying again. And if Sir Walter dies without a male child without a son, then Mr. Elliot would become Sir William Elliot. That was his plan. I Sir Walter But he had a plan B. He soon quitted Bath, and Mrs. Clay also quitted. So he and Mrs. Clay to leave Bath. This place. And but Mrs. Clay was next heard of as established under his protection in London. So they both leave Bath, and then when someone hears about them next. Mrs. Clay is under Mr. Elliot's protection. What does that mean? Um, in those days, uh, a single woman either had to have money to take care of her own household, or she had to have a man 
to help deal with the law and taxes and all this other stuff. Mrs. Clay does not have money, so she needed a man to help her. That's what this means. The man that she found was Mr. Elliot. From this fact that Mrs. Clay and Mr. Elliot are now attached, it was evident how double a game he had been playing. How wan liang mian so far. Mr. Elliot wan liang mian so far. Why? Let me explain. Oh, sorry, actually, the novel explains. Mrs. Clay's affections had been had overpowered her interest and she had sacrificed for the young man's sake the possibility of scheming longer for Sir Walter. So. Mrs. Clay's original plan was to seduce Sir Walter and marry him. But. She fell in love. With. Mr. Elliot. And because of this, she let go of her original plan. Scheming longer for Sir Walter, she gave that up. The question is, why did she fall in love with Sir Walter uh, with uh, Mr. Elliot? Because he was playing a double game. On the one hand, he was in out in the open pursuing Elizabeth. Gong Kai Cho Elizabeth. On the other hand, he was seducing Mrs. Clay. He was a Yo Mrs. Clay. Because he wants to enter the family and he wants to prevent Mrs. Clay from entering the family. And so now that he his plans have all failed, all that he has left is Mrs. Clay. So the ending for these two is also <laughs> very fitting. Sir, uh, Mr. Elliot tries to have it both ways and he loses it both ways. He tries to enter the family. He can't get in. He tries to prevent Mrs. Clay from entering the family. Now he's stuck with Mrs. Clay. And Mrs. Clay also is stuck with a terrible man. Um, in chapter 21, Mrs. Smith mentioned that Mr. Elliot completely abandoned her and her husband, even when they needed him. So it's very possible that Mr. Elliot will also abandon Mrs. Clay. So, very fitting ending. They like to manipulate. Let them manipulate each other. Um, what about Sir Walter and Elizabeth? Elizabeth we just uh, talked about. Nobody wants to marry her. What about Sir Walter? They were shocked and mortified by Mr. Elliot and his deception, Chiman. They had their great cousins for comfort. This is Lady Dalrymple and Miss Carteret. So at least they still had this connection. But they long felt that to flatter and follow others without being flattered and followed in turn is but a state of half enjoyment. So Sir Walter and Elizabeth are only happy when they have people who follow and flatter them as well. Uh, originally, that was Mr. Elliot. Now there's nobody. So it's only half enjoyment. Now that's most of the people. Oh, there's one more person, Mrs. Smith. Um, Mrs. Smith ending is very good. Originally, she had said that Mr. Elliot abandoned her, did not help her take care of her debts. Mr. Elliot 
now that Anne has married Wentworth, Wentworth uh, helped Miss, uh, helps Mrs. Smith by writing for her, uh, writing letters, by acting for her, and seeing her through all the petty difficulties of the case. To see someone through, the difficulties of the case. But they are petty. <laughs> Sorry. They are petty difficulties. Uh, so anyways, Wentworth helps to take care of Mrs. Smith's situation. She now has money again. And this part says, even though she now has money again, she is still the same good person that she was before. So Mrs. Smith has the best ending. Yes, Mrs. Smith's ending is even better than Anne and Wentworth's. And here's why. Uh, this final part is about Anne and Wentworth. So they're both happy. They both love each other. They have money, but his profession as a sailor was all that could ever make her friends wish that tenderness less. This is the only thing that makes her friends worry. The dread of a future war, all that could dim her sunshine. This is way in the difang. Way that rule about a zanzen hua. She gloried in being a sailor's wife. To glory in something. But she must pay the tax of quick alarm. Here tax is not the cost of quick alarm. Alarm here it does not mean shock and uh, like terror. Alarm here means uh, today we call this a muster. Jibing. So alarm, an alarm is when the government calls up its soldiers to send them to war. So this is the cost that Anne has to pay. If England goes to war again, she may once again have to see her husband go to war and leave her. So yes, Mrs. Smith has the happiest ending. Uh, Anne and Wentworth have the second happiest ending. Uh, and everyone else gets the ending that they deserve. Uh, and Jane Austen can't help to add one final sarcastic thought. That profession, being a sailor, which is more distinguished in its domestic virtues than in its national importance. Which means that being a sailor gives you more importance at home than being a sailor truly deserves. Like being a sailor is not that important for the nation, right? So like Jane Austen is saying that people in that society treated sailors too good compared to their actual importance. Why did Jane Austen add this last line? Well, maybe it's because. Um, let's see. The beginning of the last chapter. It says when uh, this is Jane Austen talking directly to us. When any two young people take it into their heads to marry. They are pretty sure by perseverance to carry their point. So in other words, when two people decide to marry each other, nobody can stop them because of perseverance. This may be bad morality to conclude with, 
but I believe it to be truth. So as a conclusion, maybe this is not the best kind of ending, but I think it's a true ending. So we see here that Jane Austen does pay some attention to what is a good moral ending. And in Chinese, we can say She pays attention to this, but she cares more about the truth than about a good moral ending. So maybe she adds that last line to emphasize this point. Up to this sentence, Anne and Wentworth have a good ending. Then Jane Austen points out that Anne may have to worry about whether there's another war. And finally, Jane Austen adds that sailors are not that important anyway. It's a way to end the novel without so-called good morality. So if we consider the ending of every character, it seems that everybody's ending is well deserved, except for Anne and Wentworth. And the reason that their ending is not perfect is because Jane Austen wants to remind you of their true situation. Of course, they're characters, they're not real people, but in order to help make them feel more real, Jane Austen adds this ending to remind you of if they were real people, what their situation would be like. This idea is also related to one of the questions on the final exam, whether something feels real or not. Do you have questions about the ending? And question five. All right then, now the moment you have all been waiting for, the final exam. The rules are the same as for the midterm exam. Um, for, for your answers, you should give specific evidence. And for each piece of evidence, give me the page number and line number. If there's no line number, you don't have to give me. You can just give the page number. To tell me where you found this evidence. If you use information from other sources, give me the source and also tell me which part of your answer is taken from that source? And the rule, the other rules are also the same. And I have given you some example answers. These are answers to different essay questions, but the way that these answers are structured can help you with your own answer. So for example, uh, in this answer, there is specific evidence from a specific place in the text. For the next point, there is specific evidence from the specific place. For the next point, specific evidence, specific place. And notice that 
this answer is in the form of an essay. 它不是条列答案, 它是写成文章, 申论文章. This is the kind of answer I'm looking for. Um, this one also. Right, you have, even though it's not a quote, it's a specific piece of information. So there is a specific location. So you can look at these to help you uh, write your answer. The exam will begin as soon as class is over today, and it will continue all the way through next Monday before midnight. We have class next week. You still have to come to class. Uh, if you're interested, I've already posted it on Moodle. You can read it beforehand. OK, the actual questions. Answer. One of the following. One. How important do you think the role of persuasion is in persuasion, the novel? If it's not that important, what is more important and why? So in this book, how important is the act of persuading someone? And if you think it is important, you should explain why. If you think it's not important or that something else is more important, explain why that other thing is more important. Now, the way that I wrote this question, I used the noun persuasion. The noun persuasion can mean two things. One is the act of persuading. The other meaning is a tendency, an inclination, 一种倾向或是信念或是价值. So if you want, you can also use that meaning of persuasion. The best answer will examine at least three instances of persuasion in the novel. So to get the highest score, please give me at least three examples of when somebody was in the act of persuasion or when somebody was following a persuasion. Questions about one? OK, question two. Would you describe persuasion as more like a realist novel or more like a sentimental novel? And why? You must answer either realist or sentimental. The definitions are here. Use these definitions. Realist in Chinese is 写实主义. Sentimental novel in Chinese is 情感主义小说. 你觉得这本小说比较像是写实还是情感主义? You can answer only one. 你必须要选一个。你不能两个都可以。你不能说比较多这个,比较少那个。你只能选一个. The best answer will discuss at least three significant plot points of the novel. 一样至少最好可以举三个例子. In your answer, Weigh the evidence and choose the most appropriate option, realist or sentimental. This means when you look at your three examples, maybe some of your examples will not agree with each other. Shen 
，所以你的答案不能是有一部分写实，有一部分情感主义。你的证据不一定都要统合，但是你要说就是综合而言，这本小说比较是写实主义，或者这本小说比较是情感主义。The definitions are below. You don't have to use the entire definitions. 所以我是提供完整的。定义，但是你不一定要整个定义都用上，你可以从中使用，呃，你觉得重要的部分，或者是你觉得符合你证据的部分就可以。A realist novel attempts to represent subject matter truthfully， 尽量用真的方式来呈现它的主题。Avoiding science fiction and supernatural elements。避免科幻、奇幻、超现实，不是超现实，超自然的元素。Realist authors chose to depict everyday and banal activities and experiences. 写实主义小说家，呃，呈现的是日常平庸的活动跟经验。Sentimental novels. Rely on emotional response, both from their readers and characters. 情感小说，情感主义小说仰赖情绪反应，读者的情绪反应以及人物的情绪反应。They feature scenes of distress and tenderness. 很多场景是令人担心，或是令人觉得很温馨的。And the plot is arranged to advance both emotions and actions. 情节的安排同时让呃行为行动得以前进，但也同时让情绪情感也得以发展。The result is a valorization of fine feeling. Valorization 是主要认为这样很好，认为就是把它提，这叫什么来着？呃，什么？哎，我中中文突然忘记了，就是把它当做一个一个很好的东西。Fine feeling, fine 这边是精细的意思，精细的情绪情感是一件好事。Displaying the characters as a model, 把人物当作模型，值得效法的模型 ，for refined, sensitive, emotional effect. 意思是说，这些人物的情绪反应如此的修炼，如此的敏感，是值得读者去效法的。The ability to display feelings. Was thought to show character and experience, and to shape social life and relations. 能够表现情绪的这种能力，被认为结出一个好的人格，以及很有人生经验，并且也是塑造社交生活跟社会关系、社交关系的。动力之一。So basically, a realist novel is about trying to present things truthfully and really, like everyday things. But a sentimental novel is about presenting emotions, uh, trying to elicit emotional reactions from the characters and the readers. 要引起读者跟人物的情绪反应 ，and over the course of the book, not only the action but also the emotions are developed. And in a sentimental novel, it is seen as a good thing to have sensitive emotions because it's a sign of a good character and experience, and it's the key to social life. So. Which kind of novel do you think persuasion 
resembles 比较像哪一种小说 That's question two. Do you have questions about number two? Do you have questions about the entire exam? OK, uh, that's it for today. I will be here until 440 in case you have questions you want to ask me. If you don't have questions, you can start thinking about this exam. Good luck.